Let's get into the deep menu. We access it by pressing the menu button here. And obviously a huge amount of information. This you can interact with your finger. You can interact with your joystick. You can interact with the directional pad. And the navigation is such that we have these colored tabs on the top. Red is for most of your shooting. Purple, right next to it, is your focusing systems. Blue is for playback. Purple is for our Wi-Fi settings. Yellow is for our camera settings. Then we have our customizations. A lot of this is pretty deep. And then we have our My Menu in the green tab. It's also important for me to note that this menu, the first one especially, will change when we flip our power switch to the video mode. See how it kicks us out? And if we push this again, we get things like our video resolution. And there are some other little minor things in here that we'll talk about. But I just wanted to point that out that they are slightly different on this first page. Image quality deals with the file type that we were recording, as well as the compression amount. You'll notice that we have two options here, both raw and JPEG slash high efficiency image file. So the way this works is if you if you wanna shoot raw, you would select raw and you can see this red highlight. We can also do it by touching. So this option, this first one deals with, and I'm gonna turn this one off, deals with an uncompressed raw file. And you can see that we have the number of shots remaining there on the far right, 1,413, right? So when we shoot in RAW, it is all of the original data as it hits the sensor. We haven't applied any picture styles, any even white balance. There's a lot of information that has not been applied to the image. It's 100% the RAW data. When we take that information and turn it into a JPEG, about 80 to 90% of that information is thrown away and we get a lot less processing ability of the file. So raw files are amazing when you're doing high-end work, paid professional work, and you need to have all that data there because you, you might tweak it. Now, another side note is, is that the image that we see on the back monitor is a small JPEG. So your small JPEGs that you preview the image and your raw files themselves are actually different. And, and the same is true with a regular JPEG. If you compare your RAWs with your JPEG, you're gonna see they're, they're quite different. So we also have this C RAW, and I want you to look at what happens to the number of shots remaining in the brackets there. You can see we get almost a thousand more images when we select a compressed RAW file. Now, compressed RAW files, there is a slight difference in the amount of information in there, and that's why the file size is smaller. Sometimes you get you know, deeper buffer depths. So if you're a sports shooter and you, you think, you know, compressed raw files or C raw files are enough, you may want to do that. I, I would recommend doing some tests. But the important takeaway here is you get a lot higher file quality at the expense of file space. So with this in mind, I will also want to take a look. I'm going to turn these off. And you can shoot raw and JPEG at the same time. So if you come in here and you have them both selected, here's a raw file, here's a smooth JPEG file. Each of these file types, they have a little symbol in front of them. One is smooth and one is jagged. Let me turn the raw off so it's easier to see. And you'll also notice that we get a lot more files, almost 4,700 images in this particular JPEG size. Something else that's really important to note is the resolution of the file here, 32 megapixels. And then we get the effective sensor, sensor dimensions. So if you multiply 6,960 by 4,640, you get 32 million pixels. That's the size of our sensor, right? And that's the same with RAW as well. So the question then becomes is what's the difference between a smooth L and a jagged L when the resolution stays the same? You could look, you know, on both of them it's the exact same, but on a jagged L, you get 9,000, about 500 images, almost twice as many. What in the world's going on? So the difference between the smooth and the jagged is that the smooth has less compression and the jagged has more compression. And compression is essentially when the camera decides that two pixels are close enough in color that they're the same and it just says, okay, you're the same. I've done a ton of tests on this. When I first got into photography, I was a wedding photographer shooting thousands of images and I could not see a difference between smooth L and jagged L 
So in the events that I was shooting thousands of images, I would shoot on Jagged L. And I know tons of wedding photographers who also shoot on Jagged L for workflow because the files are so much smaller and it's a lot easier to upload them and process them and output them. Just kind of depends on what you're doing. You know, if I was in a mixed lighting condition, I'd still shoot in raw as a wedding photographer. But once I got to the, you know, the reception, you know, these low level, not super important images. Yeah, Jagged L, no one ever complained about it. And then when we look at the rest of these, we can see that these are different file sizes, 15 megapixels, and it gives us the dimensions of that image file. It takes the whole image and basically resizes it. And again, we have a jagged compression that we're well over 10,000 images. And then we have S1 and S2. S1 is 8.1 megapixels, we get those dimensions. Jagged, again, smaller file size, and even a smaller file size at 3.8 megapixels. I really recommend that if you're doing lots of JPEG shooting and you're just getting started is to, to start with Jagged L because the file sizes are smaller, but you still have your full resolution. There are people who will shoot for the internet, for example, maybe like eBay, you know, posting things on eBay. Sometimes they want to come in and shoot at S2 you know, or S1, but I still recommend shooting at Jagged L because it's very easy to resize and make images smaller not so easy to take a small image and make it larger with more resolution. Now, there, there is software now that can help with this. Topaz has a number of pretty amazing products, but I would still recommend <laughs> shooting as large as possible because it's one of these things that if, if you put good in, you typically get good out. If you put garbage in to you know some editing and processing, it's going to be garbage coming out. And in important events where you have mixed lighting or a, a very important shoot, you know, shoot on raw. So that's that's the rundown real quick. So those are your image quality settings. And when we get into the cards, there's different ways to record these as well. So I'm gonna hit okay. Just leave it on Jagged L for now. Dual pixel raw basically refers to the fact that we have split pixels that have the ability to record information separately. Long story short on this is there is a lot of research done, a lot of pixel peeping, and for the amount of data and information that it adds to the file and for the hassle that it takes to process these files, it's basically not worth it. So I would just say, don't even mess with it, especially if you're a pure beginner. Still image aspect ratio, we're gonna wanna leave this on three to two. That is the aspect ratio of our sensor. There are some other aspect ratios. We got a four to three cinematic 16 by nine. My dad loves to shoot on this ratio. And then Instagram one to one, which is basically a square. So those aspect ratios allow us to use different parts of the sensor, but I still like three to two because it takes, it's using all of the real estate. And that's the first tab. So I'm navigating the individual pages. You can go side by side. You can rotate your primary selector. Your secondary selector will go up and down. You have your joystick. A lot of this is gonna just be what you're comfortable with. You can also just touch directly. Exposure compensation AEB. So we've talked about exposure compensation and this in this menu, we can change exposure compensation simply by moving this to the left or right. We can push on the directional pad, left or right. We should be able to touch on the screen and that changes in the same way that we were changing in the shooting modes that I demonstrated. There's another feature in here called AEB, auto exposure bracketing. And we access this by rotating the primary selector in this screen. And you'll see we get these two other tick marks coming away from our primary indicator here. Those tick marks indicate exposure differences that the camera will take automatically when we are in this mode. So to demonstrate this real quick, I'm just gonna select this and I'm gonna push a shutter button. And you see that the exposure changed. Obviously, radically very big differences. I'm gonna zoom out. And you can see even exposure, underexposure, overexposure. And that's what AEB does for you, is it allows us to bracket our shots, meaning that the camera can take different images, changing the exposure for us automatically. So we don't have to do it you know, ourselves between each shot, and then it returns you to your center mark. 
So in some cases, if you're shooting in a very high dynamic range situation where you have very bright highlights and very dark shadows, you're going to want a bracket. Certain museums, for example, cathedrals, certain where you have lights and darkness, you take those images and you can blend them together in Photoshop so you capture a high dynamic range. Very common for interior architecture photographers to do this when they're, you know, they're taking an interior of a home and they want to see what's outside the windows, for example. And it will remain in this mode until we return it back to zero. Now you can also shift this bracket by rotating your secondary control wheel to the left or right. And these exposures will coordinate with the numbers that they're lining up for. I would put this in kind of the upper intermediate beginning advanced shooting thing, but you should know about it. That is auto exposure bracketing. I'm going to turn it off and hit OK. Next, we have our ISO speed settings. This is where we can change our ISO, just as we did as we were shooting. And it can also allow us to set the ISO speed range, including the maximum. If we wanted to go even higher than what it's set for. 32,000 is pretty high. Let's just turn it to H for now. This would be obviously very grainy. We have our auto ISO range, so we can set the limits of how much ISO control our camera has when we're shooting with auto ISO. Very useful. If it, and I mean, I'm seeing really good performance. 12,800 if you needed it, probably gonna work if you have enough light. Hit OK. Our minimum shutter speed puts a range on how much shutter speed we can get changed in program mode as well as aperture priority mode. So if we didn't want a really long shutter speed, we could come in and change it. If you leave it on auto, the camera's gonna make this decision. If you come in and you dial in a specific manual shutter speed limit, what we're telling the camera is to not use a shutter speed slower than this number because we're, especially if we're hand holding, for example, and we don't want it to be blurry, that's something we can do. In most cases, auto is gonna be fine uh, if you're sneaking a peek and keeping an eye on everything. And that is our ISO speed settings. HDR shooting, this particular feature means that instead of shooting JPEGs, we're gonna be shooting high efficiency files. They do have greater dynamic range and they do it in a very efficient file format, but not everybody is going to have access to high files unless they are translated. So sometimes this will happen with your iPhone, for example. iPhones sometimes use high files, and if you share them, the people say, oh, I can't open it, you know, or whatever, because it has to be converted into a JPEG first. But that's essentially what this setting is. If you turn this on, you're shooting high instead of JPEGs. If you're just starting out, I still recommend shooting JPEGs for now, but this is where you can find this option. So if you're shooting a sunset, you wanna get greater dynamic range, it's something to take a look at. The HDR mode, a little involved, and I actually give a demonstration on this. We go down to the beach and I will demonstrate how to use the HDR mode shooting to capture high dynamic range images in camera. So we have a number of tools, including auto exposure bracketing, we have HDR, I'm gonna show you how to use filters and show you pretty much all the different ways you can basically cut that apple. Auto lighting optimizer is a, is a slight tweak. It's kind of hard to see on JPEGs, but it adds a little bit of a contrast bump and I never use it to, to be honest with you. It only applies to JPEG. Sometimes it, you know, in the right time and place, sure. But most of these little tweaks and whatnot apply to JPEG only. Something you'll notice is that we have this option to turn it off in manual or in bulb modes. And the reason is, is usually if you're shooting in manual, you want full control and you don't want the camera doing any weird things. The JPEG files that we get out of camera, the camera has applied a lot of processing to the color, the image shape, if you're using a wide angle lens, uh, chromatic aberration, sharpness, you know, all of these things have been tweaked when we're, we're saving JPEG images. And this particular one applies to just this optimization of contrast in the image file. I leave it off for now. Highlight tone, tone priority is another one where we get a shift towards the highlights in the image. So if you're shooting and you have really bright highlights, for example, and this is turned on, the camera will cheat the processing to try to capture those highlights as much as possible. We can enable it or have it enhanced. So by default, it's checked to use HDR at D+. For the most part, again, I don't use this because I don't like the camera doing weird things when I don't want it to. Sometimes I just want a JPEG that I am in control of 
So I also usually leave that turned off. Anti-flicker mode, we talked a little bit about it. Certain lamps will flicker different colors. I remember at a racetrack, every shot looked a little different in terms of the color. Sometimes it was orange, sometimes it was blue. When you turn this on, what will happen is the camera will recognize this and only allow you to shoot in such a way that the lighting is consistent. There's a time and place for it, but you'll also notice it will slow down your maximum frames per second if you're doing sports shooting. In page three, we have the external speed light control. And I cover this in far greater detail on a course designed for Canon speed lights. So I have, so I have courses on both the 580 and the 600 speed lights, which are amazing, very powerful. This menu option here allows us to have some control over the flash from the camera. And I don't even recommend doing this because it's just easier to do it on the flash and to make those settings there. But we don't have a built-in flash on the R7. If we did, I would cover a little bit more of these. And then on the regular crash course for the R7, I demonstrate how to use a Godox TT685C. It's a $100 flash. It's amazing for what it does but I will demonstrate that on the crash course. Metering modes we've talked about, this is a different way we can select them. I think it's easier to do from the shooting menu. Light balance we've talked about, again, this is a different way we can select them. Some people like to come into the menu to do so. Custom white balance we demonstrated, this is where we take a picture of something white and we set the white balance to custom. White balance shift in bracket is something I don't recommend that we play with. In fact, there's only one camera that I remember using this on. So it was a, actually a GH5. And it allows us to shift the white balance in different directions. Canon's white balance is pretty amazing, actually. I think it's the best. So don't even mess with it. Color space, you're going to leave this on sRGB for now. If you know what Adobe, Adobe RGB is, you would select it. This is typically for print work. This deals with the gamut of colors being used in sRGB is the most compatible, it's the most widely used, so I recommend starting there. Picture styles, I've briefly covered them. These are the recipes that the camera follows to create images and it tweaks it differently depending on the type of shooting you're doing. For example, landscape shooting, your blues and greens are gonna be more vibrant. For portrait shootings, your flesh tones are gonna be more accurate. There's a monochrome setting. Each of these settings you'll see in here, we get these weird little symbols on the top. We can adjust each of those. If we press info, we come into the detail set, we can adjust, for example, the strength of the sharpening, the fineness in terms of the detail, the threshold. We can tweak the contrast, the saturation, which is the amount of color, the actual color tone. And what I recommend in the beginning is just don't worry about these. Just shoot on auto or standard. If you want to see the difference and test it, you know, do so after you get the hang of using your focusing modes and exposure settings and changing your ISO. This is something that pure beginners probably shouldn't even touch. Videographers do a lot of tweaking in here. And on the internet, you'll see all kinds of recipe tweaks. So if you wanted something specific, you can come into your user defined and set these up starting with the picture style you want to start with. Say we'll go standard, we'll go neutral. Very common for videographers to do this. And they turn their sharpness and they turn their contrast down when they're video recording and they add all of this back in post. For now, like I said, let's just go with auto and you'll be in good shape. Clarity is another setting I, I wouldn't really recommend changing too much. This is a shift in contrast as well as sharpness. Creative filters, I never use them. Kind of fun to play with, but definitely not something you would consistently use for a camera of this caliber. Page five. Lens aberration correction is super, super important because these are instructions that correct defects in your lenses. And a lot of people are surprised to hear this. Lenses have problems with them, all of them. They're made of glass, which is a material that is very hard to be consistent. So even every lens copy is different. And what's happening here on the top, we can see the camera recognizes the specific lens we're using. And with that lens, it has information. So that information is 
communicated to the camera, which can correct things like peripheral illumination, vignetting in the corners when you're shooting wide, for example, any distortion, pin cushioning, for example. And then we have a lens optimizer. So distortion correction in this lens, it's not super warpy, but if I wanted it to turn on, I would turn that on. Definitely your peripheral illumination correction is one that you want to have on. And we can come into the digital lens optimizer and turn it high. Anyway, what I'm saying is these corrections will apply to your JPEG images. And this is one of the big reasons, especially with wide angle lenses, is you'll import RAW and JPEG side by side. They look completely different. Wide angle lenses, I would definitely say put this on. And they are very helpful. So I would recommend leaving them on for now. Long exposure noise reduction, essentially anything over one second, we get sometimes something called shot noise. And I did a video on this that even in situations where you feel like you have enough light, if there's not, you get these random patterns of what look like to be ISO noise. That's really shot noise in low light conditions where we don't have enough light to expose the sensor properly. This helps clean it up. So anything over a second, you could turn it on on auto and the camera would automatically do it, or you could turn it off and do it yourself in Photoshop, or you can make sure that it's done on every image over one second. One hang up with this is that it does take longer to process those images. I think in the beginning for now, just turn this off. High ISO speed noise reduction, definitely recommend at least this middle setting here. What this does is it takes ISO noise and the processor cleans it up so it's not as grainy. It often does this at the expense of sharpness. So you'll get these images that look a little smooth and almost plasticky if you have it on a high setting because the camera is processing that noise out. It's adding colors and pixels and things of that nature. And I don't think it looks really good. Multi-shot noise reduction is a better option is this is where you're taking multiple images and the camera is taking information from each image to stack them together. This is how smartphones do it, is even when we push the, the shutter button once on a smartphone, it's actually pre-buffering those images in low light conditions, and it sorts through them using computer software. But the short answer is if you're just shooting, standard is probably good for now. Dust delete data is a software way to clean up image specs from dust off of our images. And I had a nightmare story, this happened to me once after a wedding, we had hundreds of images that had these little specks on each photo and we had to clean it up. Now, the truth of the matter is, is you, if you have an important shoot, you want to inspect your sensor before the shoot. You do this by shooting the sky at a very small sized aperture, F22. You will see if you have any dust specks on your sensor. At that point, you would then clean your sensor physically. I will demonstrate how to do this on the crash course. I'll show you the tools that I use, or you can take it to a camera store. Some of them will do it for free. Some of them will charge you 35 to $60 each time you do it. But the correct way to manage sensor dust is to clean your sensor. Uh, I, I've never used the dust delete data, but the idea is that you come in and you can use software to basically say, hey, we have this dust spec here, clean it up. It doesn't remove the dust off the sensor. So therefore I never recommend it. Just clean, keep your sensors clean, get confident to know how to do that and you won't have these problems. Page six, multiple exposure mode is actually pretty awesome. It allows us to take multiple digital images and stack them on top of each other as we're shooting. I will demonstrate this in a real world situation on the crash course. It's kind of gimmicky, but also kind of fun. You can do a lot of these things in post using Photoshop, but this is a really interesting technique. I have to kind of demonstrate it for, for it to be clear in terms of what it is, but you can take a picture and you get an overlay of that last picture and you can put it on top of another one. And certain subject matter is also really important when you're using that. The raw burst mode is an interesting feature. We saw it on the M6 Mark II, it was a little bit cropped. Essentially, this allows for us to run a cyclical buffer before the camera starts recording. We're shooting at 30 frames per second. It's gonna be raw in the full resolution. And when we push and hold the shutter button, this pre-shooting option, halfway down, you'll see it here, we get this bar. What's happening is, oh, we get a little bit of banding here too. 
So I'm not pushing it down all the way. It's like halfway down. The camera is pre-buffering these images. What does pre-buffering mean? It means it's not recording it to the memory card yet. So when we pre-buffer and then we push down all the way, now it starts taking the images and it's, you can see that this red bar is recording. This burst is essentially 30 frames per second into one raw file that you can go in and then extract the individual images. It's kind of a software thing, still recording. But in the event that you, you know, let's say your son is doing peewee baseball and you want to get the moment the bat connects with the ball, right, on his first hit ever. So this would be a time you would want to use this because it's very hard to take an image of when the bat connects with the ball, right? So here comes the pitch, you're pre-buffering, and then right before it connects, you push it down all the way, and you can go through those files and pick out the image where this actually happens. I will demonstrate this on the crash course as well. It has its time and place kind of thing. I'm going to turn it off, obviously. Come back out. And as a side note, this raw burst mode is an electronic shutter. We have to keep that in mind. This is not a physical shutter, it's an electronic. So if you have LED lights, it could be a problem. Focus bracketing is a very important tool. You can do it without the software like this, but I will also give a lesson on this on the crash course. It has to do with taking, let's say for example, macro pictures where you're shooting very close and you have a very shallow depth of field. Well, if you've ever seen a good macro shot, everything's in focus on an insect, right? The only way you can do that is to get that maximum sharpness is to take multiple images and stack them together in Photoshop. That's how they do really good macro shots. Jewelry, product photography, the covers on our crash course, you know, guides, you know, we take a picture of a camera, we want everything sharp. Those are taken with multiple images and stacked together. So this software, what it's doing is it, it's automating the changing of the focusing point and the taking of the picture. It does it automatically once we set it up correctly and then we get multiple images and we stack them together. I will demonstrate this on the crash course as well. Page seven, we have our drive modes. This is another place that we can select them. We have our interval timer. I also do a lesson on this on the crash course. Essentially, when we turn this on, we can allow the camera to have its own built-in intervalometer. With the detail set, we, we essentially select the interval between each shot, the number of shots that we want it to take, and then we hit OK. It's, so it's a, a timer that takes pictures automatically for us. And if you do this correctly, you can get some really cool results. But this is the idea of how it works. Cancel. And I will demonstrate how to do this and the kinds of results we can get when we do it correctly in the beach shoot on the crash course. I'm going to turn it off for now. When it's on, you'll get a, a funky little icon here. See, it has the timer. You can see that this timer is working up here in, in the corner. And so every 10 seconds, it would take that picture. It's not even letting me get out of it. Turn that off. Disable. So let's talk about the bulb mode. We kind of skip, skipped over it briefly. The bulb mode is the letter B. And when you have the bulb mode, essentially what it means is that you can do much longer exposures by pushing the shutter button down. Here's the first release. And you can see that we get this timer in the bottom right hand corner. And then when I release my finger, the exposure ends. So that's what the bulb mode does. And in certain situations, you can take very long exposures, certain types of astrophotography, you'd want to use bulb mode. Uh, and then we start getting into problems with how the camera is shaking, right? Because there's, you know, if you're pushing the camera or whatever, it's a problem. So the bulb timer, if we turn this on, we can come in and tell the camera how long we want the exposure to be without needing to push the camera or shake the camera. That's the idea behind it. I'm going to hit cancel, come back out, and turn it off. And you have to be on the bulb mode for this to work. Otherwise, it'll be grayed out. This is why it's grayed out here. Silent shutter function essentially is our electronic shutter. So when we turn this to on, we're no longer using a mechanical shutter. It's all electronic. 
if you're doing certain kinds of sport shooting, maybe like baseball or golf, where somebody's swinging something really fast, you might see some distortion in terms of it, you know, not being a perfectly straight club, for example. If you're panning hard, you might see some distortion. LED lights could be a problem. Those are the most common issues that we see with electronic shooting. Shutter mode. In most examples, in terms of how the camera is set up by default, is we get an electronic first curtain shutter. And what that means is a pure mechanical shutter, if we come in here and select this, means that there's two shutters. I'm going to pretend this is the sensor here is that you have a, a physical shutter that opens and exposes the sensor and a second one that closes. And then they reset and this happens every single time you take a picture. That's pure mechanical. Electronic first curtain is a little bit different in that the exposure starts like this. The picture is taken and it closes and then it opens again and then it closes. And that's the difference between all three of these is electronic shutter is that those physical shutters do not move and it's just recorded by the sensor itself. In most cases, electronic first curtain is going to be fine. But so there are some purists out there that like mechanical shutters only. And this is where you'd come in and select it. Again, we get some of these artifacts with electronic. Very hard to see problems with the electronic first curtain, although it does happen. In any event, if you're a peer beginner, Electronic first curtain is fine. Release shutter without card. Keep in mind there's no internal memory in the camera. And so sometimes I've had people email me, they're shooting and they don't realize they're not recording without a memory card. So something to keep in mind. Image stabilizer mode. This is a digital image stabilizer for video mode. And I usually leave it turned off because I don't think it looks really great. We have incredible image stabilization as well as lens stabilization, so I rely on those more. The idea behind the auto level feature is that the camera will straighten your images automatically for you. I personally wouldn't use this because you can do it in post and I don't like the camera cropping or shifting things without my permission, so I leave this on disable. Customize quick controls allows us to change the items we have on our quick menu. If you don't remember what that is, that's these guys here on the side. When we press the Q button, we have these options here on either side. So this feature allows us to edit how these are laid out, which ones we have, things of that nature. We can check them on or off. So if I check that off, hit exit, and we save and exit, when we hit the Q button, that item is missing. I don't recommend doing this in the beginning because you, you want these items there as you're learning them. So I'm gonna leave this checked, but we can also rearrange the order depending on where we want it. So if we take this, I think we touch and drag. Yeah, we touch and drag it. Kind of hard to see with my finger, but you can move these things around in such a way that you can change the position and the ordering of them. I'm gonna hit info to return. So really cool. If I turn this one off, and I scroll down, you can see that we have a number of other options that we can put into the menu, depending on what feature you want quick access to, right? In the beginning, leave it the way it is. But if you feel like you want to tweak it in the future, something to think about, right? Save and exit. We're going to keep it the way it was. Touch shutter. This is the same as the icon that we saw on the back monitor. It's just a different way to turn it off. Image review, after we take the image, how long do you want it to play back? In some instances, sport shooting, for example, they don't want to see it at all. They just want to keep on shooting and they would come in and they would turn this to off or maybe they want it longer or, or to hold it. By default, it is two seconds. Another feature is that we can turn this on the viewfinder display as well as we're looking through the viewfinder. If you want to inspect the images as we're shooting, you can enable this. High speed display, if it's turned off like this, we need to come out to our shooting modes. I'm gonna hit Q and I'm going to choose H, regular H, not the H plus, regular H. When you select this, you should be, see it available in your menu where you can have high speed display turned on. And the idea of this is that it reduces shutter lag. So if you're shooting at a high speed burst, sometimes you'll start to see this little jitter or a little bit of lag when you're doing very, very high fast image shots, maybe it's hard to track the subject. This helps 
reduce it. Unfortunately, this is only working in the slower burst mode, but this is what it is and this is what it does. Check it out sometime. We also have the metering timer. All this does is display your aperture and your shutter speed for a certain amount of time. If you remember when we were in aperture priority mode and we were tapping, we get the shutter speed here. That's what this timer does, is that after eight seconds, this will disappear. And we can control that with the metering timer section here on page eight in the red tab. So you can have it go longer or shorter. When I'm doing video work or I just wanna see the exposure settings, I'll just turn it to 10 or 30 minutes. Page nine, this can be a little confusing. Your display simulation means that by default, it is going to display your exposure. In previous cameras, we had to make sure this was turned on to get a preview of what we were shooting. By default, it should be on this setting and I think you should leave it there most of the time. Exposure plus depth of field means that you also get a preview of the depth of field that you're shooting with. Usually we don't see this because the lens is simulating in the ballpark of what we need to get. But in some situations, you will want to see your depth of field and you would select it here. This will do it automatically or you can set it up so you push the depth of field preview button, which is the button right in the middle of the AF-MF switch in the front of the camera. I have mine customized to something different that I'll show in another YouTube video, so I don't use this. However, if you do studio shooting with strobes, you will want to be able to come in and turn it to disable, meaning that you're turning off exposure preview. So now that I've turned it off and I'm rotating my exposure compensation wheel, you can see that the brightness of the preview is not changing. You wanna do this in a studio setting because strobes are very bright and they're very quick and they're not on when we're setting up the shot. So it might be very dark in the studio. We can't see what we're focusing on. And in those instances, we would want to turn it off. And there was some glitchy weird things going on with the R5 and R6 when you're using the speed light. This pretty much solves this because you can just turn it off. Now, completely just turn that off and then when you're not in the studio using strobes, you would come back and turn this on again. OVF, Optical Viewfinder Simulation. If we turn this on, it is supposedly going to make the optical viewfinder behave like a DSLR camera. It looks supposedly more like that. To me, I like the electronic viewfinder. I like the experience, the shooting. All of it's pretty great. So we're gonna leave this turned off. The shooting information display allows us to select different kinds of settings that we see as we're shooting. So in the screen information settings, you can see that we have all, all of these different numbers, exposure settings, right? So if I was to come in and turn these off, these screens would not be available as I push the info button. They're gone, right? Remember all those different screens? Can't see anything now. So that's what that first one does. It allows us to control which screens are available. We'll hit okay to make sure it saves. And then we can also come in and toggle different sets of information, whether it's the histogram, certain shooting information, right, the level. I like them all, so I'm gonna leave that to okay. We can control whether that information is available in a vertical display. We can have a grid display, tic-tac-toe grid. There it is. There's other grids we can use, more intense, like if you're shooting architecture, this is very useful sometimes. And turn this off, we also get those diagonals. Histogram display, do you want it to be brightness or RGB? If we select RGB, there's the RGB histogram, kind of cool looking, right? We can go back to just brightness, we can have a larger or a smaller display of our histogram, right? Here's a smaller one. Let's go back to large. And then we can also have it display our lens information. For example, when we were focusing in manual mode, we saw the meter bar, we could change that to feet. I like seeing that, I think it's pretty cool. We can determine when we're focusing always or we can just disable it. The focal length display is the number that we get right here, 24 millimeters. If we didn't like seeing that, we could turn it 
off, and that is your lens display information. Reverse display has to do with when we flip the monitor around, is that it will automatically flip the image in such a way that it's taking that into consideration. If you just want it to display normally, you would turn this off. VF display format, there's different kinds of viewfinder display. I like display one, it looks a little bit wider. Let's see, and this one's a little bit smaller. Display performance deals with how often the shooting screen is refreshed. Typically, this power saving is designed to save your battery, obviously. Smooth will bump this up to 120 frames per second, so it'll be very smooth, very fast refresh rate. It will go through your battery faster. We also have this option here to info to essentially prevent very long shutter speeds from happening when we are in low light situations. So you'll notice this when you get into a dark situation, everything's kind of laggy and slow on the viewfinder. It's because it's basically using a longer shutter speed. Suppressing that would prevent that from happening and it would be faster. Just keep this in mind that the battery life is going to drain quicker and most of the time power saving is going to be just fine. And finally, this last page 10, kind of confusing. It deals with video shooting from the stills mode. So right now the camera is on the stills mode and you can see that it's set up for full HD. Tap the shutter button. So if I was to start recording in the stills mode, you can see that we get this crop, but this video format is full HD. I'm going to stop it. And when I flip over, to the video mode, you can see that it's on 4K. So you basically have two different video shooting modes depending on whether you're using the video mode or the stills mode. And the tab on this last page here is dealing with video shooting from stills mode. So we have our resolution. So if we wanted to change this, we could come in and select 4K, different frame rates, IPP. We don't get all of the settings that we get in the video mode. So I just go 4K, for example. Sound recording, very important that we come in here and we turn this to manual. And the reason is if you don't do this, there will be huge fluctuations of gain up or down if it's an auto. And right now I'm almost clipping out. Anytime you see red here, that's bad. So what I can do, I can come to my record level and I can turn this down a little bit. So this locks the gain in in such a, a way that I'm not clipping out. And the camera is not doing this auto thing where it's boosting when I'm not talking and then reducing when I am. So you definitely want this on manual for any type of video recording. I'm gonna hit okay. The wind filter, I've never really heard a major difference. So I usually turn this off. And then the audio mic noise reduction, I also usually turn this off because we do a lot of post-production on our audio where we go in and we remove sound. I talk about it in other videos on YouTube. It's a really good thing to learn how to do if you get into high-end video stuff. The noise reduction, it'll sometimes apply a filter to it and it may change your audio in such a way that you don't really want it. So turning it off and recording it manual, recording the highest level quality of sound. I, you know, if you're just getting into it, get that Maven mic, start playing around with it. But all microphones, including the lav mic I'm speaking on right now, all of them are cleaned up. So I'm gonna come back out to the menu. We have our ISO for auto ISO video shooting. And the max here is at 12,800. Change that if I wanted to. We have our auto slow shutter. I typically shoot on manual. So I turn this off, but there are times when I use aperture priority if I'm going from different lighting conditions. The auto level, I would recommend keeping this turned off. The idea is that the camera will try to straighten your video as you're shooting, which means it's going to crop it and use lower resolution. If you don't have a way to do this in post and you're constantly hand holding on or shooting on a gimbal, maybe that makes a little bit more sense, but I leave it turned off. This last one is the shutter button function for movies. So when you are in the movie mode, what does the shutter button do? Do you want it to meter and do servo autofocus? Do you want it to meter and do a one-time focus? Or do you want it to meter only? I'm gonna leave it here. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the first tab, the red tab for shooting.
Purple tab deals mostly with the camera's focusing systems. The autofocus operation deals with the focusing modes, as we have seen in other places. We have the focusing clusters also in the deep menu. We wanted to select them here. Subject tracking we have talked about. That's where the white box follows your subject. We can turn it on or off here. I think it's easier to do from the shooting menu. We have the ability to tell the camera what types of eye detection, whether it's people or animals, or whether to track vehicles. This software has been trained by Canon to accurately predict and see where these shapes are and to focus on them. You can also turn it off completely. This is the eye detection feature itself. We can turn it on or off where it's focusing on the eye. And then we can also have it switching tracked positions. The idea on this is you can make it track better or switch subjects better. And you're gonna see a lot of these tweaks in another page in this menu system. I leave it by default for here. Then we come into the infamous page two. This page will allow us to tweak our focusing systems to behave completely in different ways. In the beginning, if you're a pure beginner, intermediate shooter, leave it on auto. But if you wanna take a look at this and you come into these four other situations, you'll see it also gives an icon of different sports. For example, sprinting and ice skating. This is tennis. This is cycling. And then we get very erratic motion. Now the, the Canon 90D, it's a good DSLR, but it really kind of struggled with this really erratic motion. And the idea on each of these cases is that if you're shooting a particular sport that follows a motion similar to any of these, soccer, rhythmic gymnastics, or cycling, where it's more linear and straight, but faster, or tennis, where it's static and then it's moving and then it's static again, or sprinting, so maybe slower speeds, not dealing with you know super fast moving subjects, is that each of these defaults are set up to handle those sports differently. And those main inputs are the tracking sensitivity, which is how well it tracks a moving subject, and also dealing with how fast it accelerates or decelerates. So the tracking of change in speed. And you can see as, as we go through these, you can see these settings are tweaked a little different. So. If you are comfortable with the camera and the focusing and the exposure and all that, and you want to start tweaking your focusing settings, you would come in here and you can push the cluster button to change these settings. So we push the cluster button, we select the one we want, hit OK, and we can turn that up or turn it down. Having said this, in certain types of high level shooting, you are going to tweak this. Casual shooter, probably not as much. Again, if you're a beginner, you are going to stick with the auto in the beginning. And it wants us to push the set button to move out. Look at that, it's not working. Yeah, it looks like we have a, a, a little bug. This is not the behavior we would expect to see in a, in a polished firmware, is that we can't select the OK. We can't hit the OK button. And it's not a lot. Maybe, maybe it's working for other people, but for whatever reason, I cannot. I can hit the menu button to come back out. Let's see if there's a workaround where I hit two, I hit okay. It's selected and hit the menu button. Did it hold? Yeah. So the workaround for now until this gets fixed is to select the item you want, make sure it's highlighted. We can still change the settings. See if it holds. Return out and hit okay. Yeah. This is a bug, but instead of hit, hitting OK, what we can do is press the deep menu button. It kicks us out. It's not the way it's supposed to work, so Canon will have to issue a firmware update to correct this. This is a, this is a bug. Coming over to page three, one shot autofocus release priority. Basically what this is asking is when we're shooting with one shot, do you want the camera to be in focus? or do you prefer it to release? If it's on this focus feature, it means the camera won't take the picture until it has achieved focus lock. If it's on here, it'll just release it, focus or not. I usually leave it on this. 
Preview AF is something that I recommend leaving turned off. If you turn this on, what will happen is the camera will start pre-focusing wherever you have a focus square selected, even if you're just carrying the camera and you're not really shooting. And this does drain your batteries. It, it slows things down a little bit. I prefer to be able to pre-focus with the halfway shutter button depression when I'm ready to focus. So leave this turned off for now. Lens drive when autofocus is impossible. So basically, what do you want the camera to do when it can't get a focus lock? Do you want it to continue focusing or do you want it to stop focusing? This can be kind of a bigger deal when you're dealing with te telephoto lenses at very long distances where it starts searching and searching and it can't find anything. Sometimes it's nice to stop it, but for the rest of us, we're gonna leave it here and allow the camera to continue to focus. Auto-focused assist beam firing. This is something that you are going to want to have turned on. This deals with using an auto-focused assist beam for speed lights and flash units that we put onto the camera. And without it, we lose some focusing, especially in low light situations. So essentially when we're putting a speed light onto the camera, we can get some assistance from the speed light itself. If we wanted to turn it off, we could do that, do so here. There are certain speed lights that have LED lights that can also help with our autofocus assist. Page four in the purple tab, touch and drag autofocus settings. This is going to depend on which eye you prefer to use in the viewfinder on whether or not you're going to use it. I am left eye dominant, which means when I put my left eye here, my nose is right here. If you're right eye dominant and your nose is over here, you have this real estate that's available as you're looking through the viewfinder. The touch and drag autofocus settings essentially turns the back monitor into a touchpad that you can use to touch and drag your focusing point as you're looking through the viewfinder. So if you find the joystick here ergonomically uncomfortable and you want to control it with the monitor, that's what it is. We would come in here and we turn it on. We also have the ability to touch and drag relative to the current position or absolute. Absolute means that you have to touch on the monitor exactly where you want it to focus, reflecting into the viewfinder. Absolute is relative to where you are touching. And then we get the different touch areas. Typically, it's going to be most advantageous on this side because your, your nose is going to be over here, right? If you're right eye dominant. If you're left eye dominant, you may only have this top right corner right here. So this screen, everywhere it's white, is allowing us to determine where we would touch and drag the focus settings on our back monitor as we're looking through the viewfinder. I'm gonna leave it on whole panel for now. I actually turn it off because what happens is when I'm looking through the viewfinder, my nose starts bumping the screen. I think that's one of the reasons the relief here is, is a little bit longer, is because it keeps our nose from bumping into the monitor accidentally. So I, I, turn, I turn mine off because I'm left eye dominant. We also have a number of different clusters, and depending on the type of shooting you're doing, you may not need them all. I am going to put a YouTube video out on how I set up my customizations for bird and flight or wildlife shooting, where you might need to change your focusing squares pretty quickly, and you don't wanna to have to cycle through all of them. For example, as a wildlife shooter, you're not gonna use spot focus that much, so you would turn that off. Maybe you wouldn't use one point autofocus. And in the past, Canon would, would force you to leave one point autofocus on. So the idea here is that we can turn which clusters we want to be available to us on or off. And it's gonna require that at least one of them stay on, looks like, yep. But when you're cycling through them, if you don't wanna cycle through all of them, you would turn a couple off and then you would have a limited number of choices. I leave them all on for now. Joystick sensitivity for autofocus point selection. This deals with how quickly the focusing box will move using the joystick. Do you want it to move faster or do you want it to move slower? I have it here for now. I'll probably put mine on plus one at some point. Orientation linked autofocus point. If you do portrait photography and you're bouncing back and forth from holding the camera horizontally, and then you move it into the vertical position, which is the portrait orientation, what you'll notice is, is that if you have the same box for both of those positions, the focusing square won't change, which means you have to change the focusing square every time you rotate the orientation of the camera, right? 
So if you want separate focusing clusters and separate focusing points, you would select this. This is what I use. I love it because I don't need to change my focusing cluster or point when I'm bouncing back between landscape and portrait. If you want it to just maintain the auto focus point, you could select this. It's really preference portrait photographers or you know somebody who's shooting, let's say like, like food, for example, and you're, you're going with these different orientations. It's nice to have that square in different positions. It saves a lot of time. Page five, we've already covered this. This deals with the manual focus peaking settings. The, I'm gonna turn this off. We also have the focusing guide, which I demonstrated. And we also have the ability to turn our movie servo AF on or off. I think it's easier to do from the shooting screen. Last page on this purple tab, electronic full-time manual focus is only going to work with certain lenses. It's basically saying you can use your electronic focus at any time if this is turned on. Unfortunately, it's only with like, most of those lenses are like super telephoto. The new RFS lenses will work. I have a 24 to 105 f4, it's not on the list. So unless you have one of those lenses, you won't be able to make this work. If it's turned off, disable, it's going to follow these rules, which is the lens electronic manual focus. Now the way this works is that essentially it's allowing us to manually focus after we have used one shot, if this is turned on. So if I come up and it's on disable after one shot, you're not going to see it, but one shot enabled. So the way this works is we get a focus lock and as we hold, the shutter button halfway down and rotate our focusing ring, we can manually focus in or out. So it's sort of like a hybrid focus where we go autofocus, you have to hold it halfway down, keep it engaged, and then rotate your manual focus ring. This feature should be working with most of the RF lenses. And we can also go to a magnified version. So shutter button halfway down, rotating the ring, and we get a punch in for that manual zoom technique that I demonstrated with the magnifying glass earlier. Very handy for macro shooting, other types of product photography. I'm gonna turn, eh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it there for now. Focus ring rotation. This changes the direction of our focusing ring. If you don't like the way it's set up now, you can go in the reverse direction. And then we have the focusing lens ring sensitivity. Do you want the focusing to change with the speed or with the degree. I kind of like the speed, so I leave it here. And that is our purple tab, which is focusing. When we're talking about the blue tab, it essentially controls how we can play back our images, different kinds of information, editing, things of that nature. I rarely use any of these. Protect images allows us to select images individually, in a range, in a folder, or on a card to put a little key icon on it. So if we it's set, it puts a key icon, right? What this means is that we can't delete that image in camera as long as that key icon is there. I don't really like doing this because when I import them to my computer, some computers have a terrible time deleting these. Like you'll try to delete them and they just will not delete and you can't easily remove that key icon. So I usually leave it turned off. If you wanna select them by range again, folder, card, or you can unprotect them in a folder, unprotect them on a card, this is how you would do it. Erase images, you can, let's say you're shooting and you needed some extra space and you have some files that you didn't wanna reformat the card, you need those because you don't have a backup. This is where you can come in and you can delete images by ranges in a folder or on a card to create that extra space. I definitely recommend don't doing that. Have more memory than you need. And after the shoot, make two backups, clear the memory card off. That's my workflow typically. This will allow us to do it by a range, folder, and in a card if you needed to delete them. There's a little sensor in our camera that knows when we are rotating the camera to portrait versus landscape orientation, it's horizontal or vertical. And typically it will automatically rotate the images, but when we're shooting straight up or straight down, it can be confused. So this feature allows us to rotate in camera by using the set button. Change movie rotate information is asking if we import this video into a smartphone, which 
of the four sides do you want to be facing up? So when I hit the set button, you can see we get this arrow icon dancing around the camera icon, and it's asking us which side do you want to be up on a smartphone. Rating allows us to put a star one through five on an image, and when we import the images into Lightroom or Bridge, those software programs would recognize it. So if you have a shoot and then you have three images that are just amazing, and you want to put, let's say, a star icon on it, we can come in. A little confusing. There's the five star icon, right? And we could do this for other images too, right? Or even the video. You can do it by a range of images. We could do all the images on a card, all the images on a folder, these two guys. And then, then when you import them, those programs will respect those ratings and you should be able to find them right away. Image copy. Let's say we're shooting an important event and we have some great images on memory card one and we wanna save those images to memory card two. We could come in and select all images and it would make a backup. Copy to card, right? If we wanted to go there. Or we could choose a specific image, a range, or a folder. So depending on what you're doing, if it's a pro shoot, typically you should be saving to both memory cards at the same time. There's a feature in the yellow tab that I'll show how to set this up. But this is just copying after the shoot. Page two, I don't really use either of these. Print order allows us to determine which images we would print from our camera if we connected from our camera by USB to a printer. So if you don't have anything else, this is how you would do it. You could select images, multiple images, and then you would set these up for print. I typically take the memory card out or you know, upload to a computer and edit. So I have a completely different workflow, but maybe if you're on vacation, you had something amazing, you didn't have a computer, but there was a printer, you would connect with your USB port to the printer. And, and there's also compatibility issues. You know, Not every printer is gonna be compatible, but you would be able to try to set this up to print from camera. The photo book setup, I never use. This allows us to select certain images for a photo book. You can go by images or multiples. Image raw processing allows us to take a raw image and turn it into a JPEG or a Hive. So we can select images, let's select this, we'll hit okay. And let's say we wanna process it as a JPEG. We get a limited number of options here where we can change the contrast, the brightness, different white balance settings, picture styles, basically some minor tweaks, and then we can save it as a new file. So very minor processing in camera. So we wanna show the original image. So I just made a copy of it from a raw file, right? Creative Assist are these really intuitive sets of information that we can adjust if we want. There's nothing professional in here. It's just more of an intuitive thing to change the, the brightness or darkness, for example, light things of that nature. Quick Control raw processing allows us to determine which of the raw processing we want available on the Quick Control screen, which is this screen right here. We can customize this obviously. So which of those two raw processing features do we want out here? Cloud raw image processing requires Wi-Fi to be connected to the internet in order for this to work. I'll have a different Wi-Fi lesson coming soon. Playback creative filters. Again, we have seen this in other places. These are these little gimmicky filters we can apply if we wanted to. We can also resize the image. This is when we take the original image and we change it to a medium or a small one or a small two in camera. It will create a new file. So if you wanted to, I don't know, share it maybe through Wi-Fi or you just wanted to have it available, this is where you would do it. I usually do this on my desktop computer. Cropping, we have a bunch of crop features in here. So if we wanted to change the crop in camera, we could do this by rotating the primary selector wheel. We can move it around with our joystick. Do we touch and drag? Nope, oh, there it is. We can also tilt the image if we wanted to using these arrows in the top left-hand corner. We can change the aspect ratio in position if we wanted to, and then we can save it as a new image. We'll pop out of here. Hive to JPEG conversion. We talked about this a little bit earlier is that the Hive file type isn't compatible 
with all computers and smartphones. So if you have Hive files and you want to convert them into JPEGs, this is where you would do it. You would select the files you want, and then it would ask you to save them as JPEGs. Slideshow, I used to use this as a wedding photographer back in like 2006 and 2007. We would shoot the ceremony, and then I'd have my assistant play them at the reception as everybody's coming in. You essentially come in here and you set up how long do you want the images to show for. In this case, it would be about three to five seconds. I think three seconds is pretty good. Enabling the repeat puts it on a loop. And so once you start this, the images are gonna be playing out of the HDMI port. So you plug that into your computer and you can just have this continuous loop playing. Set image search conditions allows us to search by different parameters. So we have our star rating, the date, the folder, which items are protected, video files, types. Now this is a little confusing because when you designate the search parameters, your playback is locked into that particular parameter. So let's make sure we don't have this on. I'm gonna clear that. We'll just go with date, for example. We'll hit OK. It's saying specify search image conditions. They do not apply when accessing from an external device. So when I come back and I hit the play button, we get this yellow box around the border. That tells us that we are using this search feature and the camera will only display those items that we designated in the search menu. I'm gonna come back here and clear them so we can access all of them. So if you ever see that yellow box around, that's, that's what's going on. View from last scene means is that when we're playing back and we're scrolling through the images, for example, let's play back, it is going to replay this from the last image we saw. I tap the shutter button, hit it again, there it is. When this is turned to disable, it will display the last image that you shot versus the last one you looked at. Magnification is something that we can do. I think it's easier to do this from the image itself where we can touch and drag and just zoom in like this when you want to magnify. But if you're interested, we do have this magnification button here on the side so we can, we can zoom in once. We can use the primary selector to zoom in. And what this does is it helps us to control the magnify feature that we see here. Is it 2x, 4x, 10x, same as last. We can magnify from the focusing point or from the center. And we can also maintain the position of the magnification as we're browsing through different images. Kind of cool if we're comparing sharpness in somebody's eyes, for example. Image jump with our primary selector wheel. So when we're playing back images, we can jump through multiple images. You can see it here showing every 10 images as I rotate my primary selector wheel. We can change that to be single images. We can jump to a specified number down here on the bottom. We can jump by date, by folder, movies only, stills only. We can jump to protected images only. We could jump to star ratings, and we could jump to the first image of continuous shooting. Usually it's on 10, but this is how we jump through our playback. When you're playing back, I think it's also really easy. You can just zoom out like this, keep zooming out, and you can touch and scroll. It's typically how I do it when I'm looking for something specific. Page six, playback information. This is the types of information we want displayed when we are playing back an image. So if you push the play button, let's zoom in on this one, and I toggle the info button, we can see our exposure settings, ISO. We can see that this was, uh, looks like a created JPEG. If I continue to hit the info button, you can see that we get different types of information. So, this allows us to determine which of these screens are available and which ones are not. Let's see here, let's find a different one that wasn't created in camera. I hit the info button. We can scroll down, we can see all types of information on this screen. EXIF data, we have our color, RGB histograms, the lens, the focal length. So if you don't wanna see all this information, you'd come in here, 
you could turn off these screens that are available. And you'd hit OK. Highlight alert is kind of useful. It basically tells us when we have overexposed something. So let's go into manual. I'm going to turn this ISO way up. Take the picture, and you can see that it, when we play it back, you see it's it's going to be blinking. I get a lot of questions about this. So when the highlight alert is on, anything that's overexposed, that's pure white or brighter, you're going to see this flashing. So you'll see it in skies a lot. That's what the highlight alert does. It blinks anything that's overexposed. Auto focus point display. If we enable this. So there's a little bit of confusion of, on this, is this is the focusing square that was used, not necessarily where the camera was focusing. Those are two different things. So it's really just telling us which focusing square was used, and it can help with some troubleshooting, but it doesn't give an accurate representation of where the camera was focusing. So I usually leave this turned off. Playback grid, if you'd like to see a grid on your images as you're playing them back, there it is different types of grids in here. When we are doing movie recording and we're playing it back, do you want to see the record time or the time code? I think record time makes more sense. Let's see if we can find a video here. In fact, we'll just turn this down real quick. Let's make a video real quick. Let's record. Just a couple seconds. So when I come into playback and I hit play, there it is on the bottom. You see it right here? So we're looking at the time code in terms of record time. The other one is time code. Let's see if it'll do it now. There it is. A little bit different where we get different types of time code playback. So anything that is HDR captured, there are some HDR files that we can take, different features like that, high files and we want to play those back at HDR, we would need to turn this on and feed it out through the HDMI cable. And that is the blue tab, which deals with playback. I will have a separate Wi-Fi lesson coming. This is the deep purple menu. And you notice that we also have airplane mode on here if we want to turn that on or off. But this Wi-Fi section will allow you to connect to your smartphone to use it as a remote or to transfer images to your smartphone in order to upload to social media. It's a little bit more involved and I think it deserves its own separate lesson. I should be putting this onto my YouTube channel. The yellow tab has a lot of very important camera settings, including record function card selection. So we have two different memory cards and this allows us to determine how those cards work. If we come in here and turn it to enable where we have the separation that means Card one is going to be stills, card two is going to be video. You notice we get all these grayed out when we do this. If we're using both memory cards, we have record options for stills. So for still shooting, standard means that we're shooting to one card only, and when it fills up, you're done. Auto switch card means that when you are shooting stills, if the first card fills up, It'll start a new folder on the second card once it's full, and it'll continue shooting on that second card. Record separately means that for shooting stills, we can have JPEGs and RAW separated to different cards. So you can have RAW images on one card, JPEG images on the other. It does not work with compact RAW. And record to multiple means that copies of each image are recorded to both memory cards. This is typically what wedding photographers paid professionals are doing. They're making backups to two cards in case there's a card failure. Most of us are going to be shooting on auto switch card, which just means as the first card fills up, we go to the second card. But this is a preference thing. You can do it however you like. We have similar options for video. We have standard where we're recording video to one card. We can have it auto switch, which means when the first card fills up, it'll start recording to the second card. Or we can record to both cards at the same time. On these two guys here, record play for card one and record play for card two, it's asking which of the two cards do you want to be your primary card? Which ones are we targeting first? 
And then we have some folder options where we are recording to a folder on card one. If we want to create another folder, we can do so by pressing the set button. And OK, we can change the folder name if we want to. Just some options there for folder creation. Come back out. File numbering. Continuous numbering means is that if we're shooting and we're up to like 91, and we switch our memory cards, put a new memory card in, or we switch to the other memory card, the next image will be 92. Auto reset means every time we take the card out and put a new one in, it's going to start over. I have mine on continuous. And a manual reset resets the image numbers automatically. So if we press this, it would revert back to 0001. File name, we can change the first few letters of the file name if we want. Image, I could put M-A-V-E-N for Maven or Michael or whatever I wanted to do, but we get a few limited number of options here. We have to kind of delete these guys first. M-A-V-E-N. For so instead of seeing the default image, I would see Maven and then the file number. It's kind of a fun thing to do, right? And we also have it the same for user setting number two. Format our memory cards. We've already talked about this. Once you have two copies of your files in different places on different drives, maybe on the cloud and one drive, you want to have two copies always before you format your memory cards. And as a way of workflow, when I come in from a shoot, I download the images immediately, start charging my batteries again. Once they've uploaded to the first hard drive, I make a copy to the second hard drive. And then when I'm sure I have two copies, I'll put the cards back into the camera and I'll reformat them. That's how I do it. Do not do that unless you have two copies. Auto rotate, we're going to leave this on on for the camera and our computer. It means that when we shoot in the portrait orientation, the camera will automatically rotate it for us. We can add rotate information for videos if we want. We saw this in the playback menu that there's different ways to, to turn and orient the camera to accommodate smartphones. But for the most part, I'm shooting horizontally like this. Date and time, we've already set this up. But if you needed to change it again, this is where you would do it. Coming over to page two, we have tons of different language options. Hopefully, you're an English speaker. But if you're not and you have a different native tongue, there's lots of different options here to read the menus. If you know what PAL is, you are going to set this because your country requires that. It's 25 frames per second. NTSC in the United States and lots of other countries. If you don't know what PAL is, leave it at NTSC. Help text size, we can make it large or small. The mode guide is something that we demonstrated earlier and we turned it off. It's like a little prompt when we change our mode settings. Page three, beep. If you want to turn the beep off, we can do that by coming in here. It's typically most often heard when we're focusing. The volume for playback in shutter, uh, lots of different features in here. We can come in and change the volume of different sounds. The focusing beep, the shutter volume, all of these things. So there's a shutter volume. We have touch sounds, self timer. All of those volumes can be adjusted. We can adjust our headphone volume. If we are monitoring audio, we're not doing that right now, but if we were, Here's how we change the volume of our headsets. Power saving features tells the camera when to turn off. I changed these in the beginning of the lesson because the camera was turning off like every 30 seconds. So we can make a screen dimmer, turn the screen off completely, turn the camera off completely, or turn the viewfinder off. All of these are power saving and the battery life so far has been phenomenal from what I've seen. Screen and viewfinder display determines how this sensor here works. Right now it's on auto one, that's the default. So these first two items are a little confusing. They're very similar in that they control when the screen is in this position and facing us. And when we look into the viewfinder, it turns this off and turns this on. The only difference between these is that in the first one, when we open the screen, and you can't, I know you can't see it, I'll, I'll put it a little bit so you can see this here, is the switch doesn't work. When the, when the monitor is open. So there may be a time that you wanna do that. If you have it on setting two, let's do that. You can see it's turning off now. Flip this back. 
So depending on how you shoot, maybe with a gimbal. Viewfinder means only the viewfinder is going to be on. And if you set it up this way, you have to look through the viewfinder to turn it back. Let's see. When I shoot with a gimbal, I almost always turn it on to this last option, which is screen, which means that the, the monitor switch is not working. For now, I leave it on this first option. Screen brightness is exactly what it sounds like. We can come in here and can control the brightness of our back monitor. Viewfinder brightness, same thing. We can go to manual and increase it or decrease it. You'd have to look through the viewfinder as you're doing this. We can change the color tone of the viewfinder from warmer to cooler. I think two is fine. This is essentially a color adjustment for the viewfinder. I don't recommend messing with it too much because it'll change the color tone. User interface magnification. If we have this enabled and we double tap with two fingers on the screen, we get a little magnification. Hey, sometimes I don't have my glasses on and I, I can't read, so it's kind of nice for guys like me. When we're exporting video out of the HDMI, which resolution do we want to export at? Do we want it to be auto, or do we want to force it to be at 1080p? Page four. Page five, the touch control is this back monitor. It's essentially asking how sensitive or turned off you want it to be, so standard is fine. The multi-function lock on the top of the camera, this guy right here, this button, this lock is controlling these items in here. So if you want to turn off your primary selector, your touch control, maybe your control ring, you can determine which of these features we're turning on or off. Just gonna cancel that. So the switch on the front of the camera, the AF-MF switch, that's the autofocus manual focus switch, it doesn't work with every lens. It's only with a certain select number of lenses, which is interesting. Maybe there will be some firmware updates that will allow it to work on more RF lenses. It doesn't work on my 24 to 105 F4. When I turn the camera off right now, the shutter is closing and it's protecting the sensor a little bit, preventing some dust and stuff. If we don't want that to happen, we could leave it on open. If you took the lens off, you would be able to see the sensor. When we clean the sensor, it will need to be exposed. So we'll come back to that. Here's sensor cleaning. So there's a very thin membrane which covers the sensor. And when it's set to at power off, what that means is it will vibrate and kick sensor dust off of that membrane. It's a self-cleaning mechanism. When we have it on enable, this will happen when we turn the camera on or off, and we can also disable it. Let's just leave it at power off for now. We can force the camera to clean now. This feature has been around for a while, since the 40D, if I'm not mistaken, back in 2007, 2008, I want to say. And then we just did a sensor clean. And then there's the clean manually, which I will demonstrate on the crash course. It's not as intimidating as you would think. There are certain tools that I use to visualize, to actually see the sensor dust, to remove it without getting the sensor wet. And there's other wet tools. It's, it's a little bit involved so i put that on the crash course and if you take it to a camera store some stores will do it for free some will charge you 35 to 60 dollars so the connection app that i use connects through wi-fi but we have some other options here and the wi-fi app is actually pretty good it's it's one of the better working apps for cameras which brings us to page six if we want to reset the camera settings we would come in here and do so you can see that we can reset all of the basic settings, or we can come into some of these more defined settings from the customization of our quick controls, our information display, communication settings, copyright, customized controls, even the, our My Menu. So if you want to reset your settings, this is where you can come in to do it. We talked about custom shooting modes. This is where we dial the camera in the way we like it, and we register the settings to either the C1, C2, or C3, which can be accessed by our mode dial on the top of the camera. We can clear those settings. I think we set one up on C1. And we can also have auto update, which means that as you are shooting on C1, or C2, or C3, and you're changing your camera settings, it will remember those changes. Battery info gives us some information about the battery life in terms of the remaining capacity, the number of shots we've taken on it so far, 
the recharge performance, you'll notice that we won't get these highlighted in green as your battery gets older. And over a couple of years, eventually you'll need to replace it. Copyright information allows us to enter our names or our business copyright details into the EXIF data of the file. So we can come in here, type in our name or maybe our business, and it would be recorded to every file that we use or take. Manual software URL, if you want to scan this and get the downloadable PDF, it's almost a thousand pages long. I think you're very smart to be watching this on YouTube. When you're ready for the advanced course, invest a little bit of money. It will definitely be worth your while. Even if you don't buy my course, at least buy somebody's course who can quickly walk you through the real world shooting aspects of the Canon R7. It's a very powerful camera. But reading a 1,000 page manual, it's going to take you a lot longer and it, and it is definitely not as interesting. These are certification logos here. They don't do anything besides display these. And we have our firmware update. Essentially, this means is that when Canon finds bugs with the camera, let's say this purple autofocus thing that, that I found, and they want to fix it, they will issue a firmware update. It'll be like version 1.02. It can also do it for lenses. It's essentially the software. We download it from Canon's website to our desktop computers, and we transfer that firmware into one of the memory cards. We put it into the camera, and when we're ready to update it, the camera will recognize the new firmware update. And you want to have a full battery charge when you do this. It'll update the software. Canon has made some great improvements in some of the other cameras that we've seen, the R5 and the R6, improved focusing systems, all kinds of really nice upgrades. We make suggestions in, their, in our Facebook group. We, we make a list and then I'll make a video about it. And sometimes Canon sees it and makes changes or maybe they just so happen to do it. But at least we get some input, a way to feedback when we have a lot of users in that Facebook group. That's why that's one of the reasons why we do it. And that's your yellow tab. The orange tab is mostly highly detailed customization settings. The vast majority of these I leave on default. I will point out what these mean so you know what they are and you can change them if you want to. Exposure level increments in one third stops. Every time we rotate the primary or the secondary selectors, we get this little notch. That notch is a one third stop increment. If you wanted it to be one half stop increment, you would select the second option. And it's the same idea with ISO. Do you want to change in one third increments or in one stop increments? Speed for metering is basically asking after we meter using auto ISO, do you want the camera to jump back to the auto ISO setting or do you want it to maintain the ISO setting it selected? I leave it on this one for now. Bracketing auto cancel means is that when we turn the camera off, do we want the auto exposure bracketing to be turned off? So if it's turned on, that means you use AEB, you shoot, you turn your camera off, and it will reset it. If you want AEB to stay on, you would turn this to disable. Bracketing sequence. A zero here means an even exposure, a negative is an underexposure, and a positive is an overexposure. This allows us to select the sequence of those exposures when we use AEB. We can also select the number of bracketed shots, three, two, five, or seven. So if you had seven selected and you go AEB, you'll see seven tick marks for the bracket. I think three is plenty when you're getting started. Safety shift is something that I don't use. I like to have my students learn the camera, the manual settings, the shutter and aperture priority. It's saying that when we're using shutter priority or aperture priority modes, we have something dialed in, are we going to give the camera permission to try to save us if we have something overexposed? Well, sometimes things are overexposed, like the sun, for example. Sun's almost always overexposed. And I don't like the camera making changes without me knowing exactly what it's doing because I, I don't know what happened, right? We can also change those settings with our ISO speed if we wanted to. I typically leave it on disable. That's the first orange page. Some of these are obscure. For example, this one here, same exposure for a new aperture. So let's say I change lenses and the, and the new lenses has a new aperture. 
This feature is asking if the camera wants to make exposure changes to the new lens in such a way that exposure remains. So let's say you're, you're shooting really quick and you're changing lenses and you don't have time to fuss with the settings. We can give the camera permission to change the exposure using ISO or maybe ISO and shutter speed, right? Or maybe just shutter speed. So if you do things we're using, uh, a, you know, like teleconverters or, you know, lenses that have radically different apertures and you don't have time to change the exposure settings, you would come in here and select one of these. Auto exposure lock metering after focus is saying is that when we push the shutter button halfway down, the camera does measure the scene. And if we're using the evaluative mode where it's check mark, it means it's going to lock the exposure until we take the picture or we lift our finger up. In any of those metering modes, if we check mark them, we can have that lock apply to each of those. And I only have these two selected because these are really the only ones I actually use. I'm hit OK. We can determine our shutter speed range for the camera in mechanical or electronic shutter from 30 seconds to 1 1 to 1 8 thousandth of a second. And for electronic, it's 30 seconds to 1 16 thousandth of a second. But if we wanted to limit those, we could come in and change those. Same thing with aperture. Aperture is typically going to be limited by the lens itself. For example, this is a f22. It's the minimum aperture. And when you switch lenses out, they each have their own limits. So I guess there are some lenses that have some pretty crazy high number apertures that you could limit if you wanted to. I just leave this by default normally. It's page two. Page three, primary and secondary selector direction set for shutter priority and aperture priority. What this is saying is if, if you want to change the direction of your primary and secondary selectors, you could swap those. We can also change the direction of our control ring. The control ring is on the, on the front of most RF lenses, and there's a way to customize those. I'll point out in just a second. So you can change the direction if you wanted to. This third option is asking if you want to swap your primary and secondary selector features. This would be your primary or your main dial, and this would be your secondary if you come in here and enable this. So let's talk about customizing buttons. This part of the menu is exactly the same as this black screen. If we hit Q and we come to our camera customizations, it's the same exact menu. If we come into, let's say, customize dials and we select the control ring, most RF lenses have this additional control ring that we can customize in different ways. And if I don't select anything, it kicks me out. So if you wanted a way to change, for example, your exposure compensation using your control ring, you could do that. Or maybe to change your white balance. I have a buddy that does that. Or maybe other settings, picture styles, things of that nature. So you can customize that control ring. And in this part of the menu, this is what it's asking. Do you want to customize buttons or dials? Same way we did back button focus. We have one column for stills, one column for video. I'll have some YouTube videos coming show, showing how I customize for portraits and sports shooting. Hope to get those up soon. We can also clear all of our customized settings. Page four, add cropping information. This is a little confusing because it only works unless you're shooting in a three by two aspect ratio, is this will add uh, aspect lines to your images that you can crop out. I never use it. Audio compression, if it's on enabled, you will get smaller files, but the audio won't be as good. I haven't done the tests on this to actually listen, but usually it, it's gonna, going to be fine. If it's a problem, I'll make another video and say, hey, change the setting. The default erase option. So when we play our images back and we hit the garbage can icon, you'll notice by default, the cancel button is highlighted. We can change that so the erase button would be highlighted, but there's a danger of accidentally bumping that once you hit this, you may not want to delete it. So this is like a safety mechanism, is that we can determine what is highlighted when we go to delete images. So we can have cancel selected, we can have erase selected. We also have these options for raw. So if you have a raw image, erase selected or non, 
raw image JPEG or high files. I'm going to leave it on cancel for now. If we adapt, for example, let's say a non Canon lens, something that the camera body doesn't recognize, maybe a pinhole camera, maybe some really wacky, weird lens that the camera doesn't recognize, and we still want to use our camera to take pictures, we would have to turn this feature to on. We're basically telling the camera we want to take pictures even if there's no lens that it recognizes on the lens mount. And some lenses will zoom in and out. They have a, a power feature that manages them. This is asking, do you want to retract the lens when we turn the camera off? If you want to clear all of the custom settings, you would come in here and hit this. This includes your customized buttons and dials and all everything in the orange tab. And hit cancel for now. That's your orange tab. Green tab. This is our My Menu tab, probably my favorite tab in here because, as you know, we have covered a tremendous amount of information in the deep menu button. The truth of the matter is, you're probably going to access less than five of them regularly. The rest you'll have to dive in deep. I can tell you right now the ones that I use are usually quality, format, maybe how the cards are used, and that's really about it. So, the way we can customize this is we can add a My Menu tab. We'll add one tab here. Go to Configure, select Items to Register, and it has everything in here. All of the stuff that we've covered in the menu section, and there's a lot of them. Right, all the red tab, all the purple tab. And there's one that I'm looking for that I use pretty often that I don't wanna have to go looking for. That is the format card. So I'm gonna say, yeah, I wanna register the format card to this tab. Let's add another one. How about customize buttons, just for the fun of it. We'll just put it in there, right? And we'll hit okay. So once this is done, I can come out. Here's my custom page, page number one, and I have format card, customize buttons, and customize dials. They're ready to go. I don't have to go deep diving in the menu every time I want to see them, right? Maybe another one that would be good for our video would be like our audio levels, for example. But anyway, you get the idea. If we wanted to create more tabs, we could. We could delete the My Menu tabs. We can configure it. If we want to register or sort them, we would select it and we can move the order around. It's really nice. It's a, it's a great time saver. If you don't like them, we can delete the items. We can delete them from the tab. We can delete the tab. We can rename the tab. My menu one, let's call it, let's call it M1. M1. Great. Come back out. There it is. And you can see we changed the name of it right here. Now on the second page, we have some other options here. We can delete the My Menu tabs, delete all items. And the menu display is, is asking when we hit the, the menu button, where do you want to open it to? A normal display will open to you anywhere in the deep menu, or it'll take you straight to the My Menu tab, or it'll take you only to the My Menu tab. So those are some nice options for customization. Having finished the deep menu system, I want to point out, or also get a bazillion emails about this, is that the menu system will change depending on the mode setting you have. So I'm going to flip this over to the dummy mode on video. And when I hit the menu button, you'll notice the menu items are missing. They don't look the same. And you'd, you'd see that for stills as well. So just make sure your mode dial is set to P, FV, TV, AV, or M. Any of those modes, you should see the full menu set. Now that we're in the video mode, I also want to demonstrate that as I'm turning the mode dial, you'll notice the modes are changing here. Here is P mode. FV doesn't show us anything new. Here is TV. Let's zoom in a little bit. Here's our AV mode, and here is our manual mode. The vast majority of the time when I am shooting video, almost always, is in manual mode. The exception is when I am going from very bright or very dark conditions and, and vice versa, because if you fumble with the camera for the exposure settings, it's going to look like a weird shot. So if I have a you know, a shot on a gimbal and I'm going from indoors to outdoors, I'll often shoot on aperture priority mode or manual mode with auto ISO and I will demonstrate some of these techniques on the crash course. 
When we come into the menu system, it appears to be the same, but it is not. On the first page, we have a few really important new settings. The most important is our movie resolution. You'll notice we have three different formats here for 4K. We have 4K fine, 4K normal, and 4K crop. The way this works is that 4K fine oversamples the entire image. It captures everything that hits the sensor. And then the processor turns that into a 4K frame at these dimensions here on the top, 3840 by 2160. In order to do this, it requires a tremendous amount of processing power and the camera will get hot. Canon says under normal conditions, you have about 30 minutes of video recording at 4K fine. And you have to turn the camera off and let it cool down. This 4K fine, is very sharp, very detailed. You'll, you'll notice a crispness to it more so than regular 4K. So what's happening during regular 4K? There is something called line skipping or pixel binning. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing on this camera. My guess is it's line skipping. It's essentially where the, the camera is throwing away every three lines of data, it's just throwing it straight out. Pixel binning is where it takes four pixels and it just turns them into one. And so when you see videos made this way, it's not as data heavy on the processor, but the result is it's not as sharp of an image. And you'll notice it right away when you do this side by side. Canon is saying you have unlimited video recording at 4K. 4K crop is exactly what it sounds like. And that is that the camera is using a smaller part of the sensor. So when we turn this on, it should be really punched in close because it's cropping out the image and it, it won't overheat because there's nothing to throw away. It's just using a, a smaller part of the sensor and therefore it is magnified as we are recording. It's not really great when you're shooting in small spaces, but it's another way to shoot if you need that tool. This last one here is full HD. It's 1920 by 1080. And in some cases you'll see it doesn't like certain combinations like 4K crop, it wants 60 frames per second. Full HD, you can shoot at all three of these frame rates, 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second. In the United States, video is typically played back at 30 frames per second. I almost always shoot at 30 frames per second. Film is recorded on the celluloid film at 24 frames per second. And this setting here, 23.98 is the closest thing that we have to film. And Another quick side note is you want to take your frame rate, double it, and inverse it to get your shutter speed. So if I'm shooting at 30 frames per second, I'm almost always at 1 60th of a second if I'm trying to get that film-like look. It's a whole other topic. Just a side note, I cover the different shooting styles and the different shooting techniques on the crash course. It's a lot to go into here. And then we have two compression types, IPB. I, I like to use this idea of I like peanut butter. It's simple, it's easy. And the way this works is it's a type of compression that analyzes the present and the last and the next frame and it asks what's changed. And if nothing's changed, it's able to throw away some information and just say, hey, use the last frame. The problem with this is it's very processor heavy and you will get overheating quickly with certain cameras when, it, when it's done. Now there's another format called all I, which is that type of compression, much larger file sizes. It's just, it's just capturing individual images. So you get huge file sizes, there's no overheating. But on this camera, on the R7, we have IPB and RPB light, which is, you'll notice the record time up here. IPB light is a much smaller file size and you can also probably guess the image quality isn't gonna be as good. So I'm usually shooting it on, on IPB. Now we also have this option here, high frame rate. When we turn this on, it takes our full HD frame and jumps it up to 120 frames per second. When we record at higher frame rates and then we play it back at regular speed, 30 frames per second, everything is slowed down. It's a really cool effect and I will demonstrate this again on the crash course and show you some different ways to use it. For now, I'm going to turn it off we also have a digital zoom, which I never use. I never use it because you can do all of this in post. I just record on the full sensor size. And a digital zoom isn't, it's not an optical zoom, it's a fake. It's where it's just magnifying the image you have. Sound recording, 
Very important that you are on manual and you have turned your levels down. Here, we don't want to be clipping out. I like having it here on this first page because I know exactly where it is in the menu. And as we scroll to the right, there's going to be some other options that we haven't seen, such as our ISO settings for video. It's the same as we saw that for the stills, but this is applying to video. What's the maximum for your auto? What's the range? What, what setting do you want to have right now? If you're using a time lapse, what's the maximum ISO setting? We also have Aperture priority, eight stop increments. If you turn this on, you will get the ability to change your increments in one eighth stop intervals. I like three, I stick with it, but this would be for more control. We don't see this auto slow shutter because we're not turned on the AV mode, turning it over. There it is. Essentially the idea on this is if you're shooting with aperture priority mode in slow settings and you're shooting at 60 frames per second, this gives it permission to revert down to 30 frames per second. That's really what's happening. So you can automatically change the shutter speed if you have this turned on. I'm not a fan of that. I can do it on, on my own, you know, so I just leave it turned off. Some other settings in here that you have to be aware of. Canon log settings. This is a pretty big deal for the R7 to have Canon log on it, C-Log3, because it is a great, log for recording video. So what is what does this do? When we shoot in C-log, you'll notice that the, the image looks a little bit desaturated. It's not quite as sharp. But the idea of this is it's a recording setting that allows us to capture a higher degree of color and dynamic range. And this is recording at 10-bit 422. Those are fancy words of saying more colors and more color information in the image file. In order to do this, you're gonna need a very fast memory card. You won't be able to do it with a, a bare bones class U3 card. You're gonna need something like this, an Extreme Pro UHS-2 card. This is, it's gonna be class V60 or higher, V90, probably even better. Alik Griffin has a great website that kind of lists all the cards and, and how to use them. So if you know you're gonna be shooting Canon Log, make sure that you have a very fast memory card. We'll also put, put this in the Facebook group, the links to that information. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've produced two films. I was a cinematographer on one of them. And we only would shoot at 10-bit 422 or higher. We wouldn't shoot on the normal 8-bit 420 settings that you get on most, most of our pro prosumer cameras. And the reason is we want that color information in order to grade in post-production. On the crash course, I will also demonstrate, for example, using tools like this, using an external recorder like an Atomos Ninja 5, which is a whole different ball game because we can record at that all I type of format. We get this ProRes format that we can record at when we record externally. It's, it's a very deep rabbit hole. Suffice it to say, the camera is very capable. It has some amazing video features in it. My only hope is that it doesn't overheat quickly. There's a couple other settings in Canon Log I wanna show you is the view assist. This is worth turning it on, is, is it allows us to preview what we're shooting, including with the color space that we have. We have these different color spaces to play with. If you don't turn it on, what you record and what you see are going to be different. We also have some of these characteristics in terms of using C-Log, the strength of the sharpness, saturation, and hue. Wouldn't mess with these, are you? Some people will probably turn saturation down, I would imagine. So the take home message on this is that we get C-Log3, Canon Log3, very good, very well known, recording at a higher data rate, 10-bit 422, with better chroma subsampling for editing. If you're brand new to video recording, the short answer is do not worry about this. If you wanna know how to use it and some of these other video tools, check out the crash course. There's some other settings in here. Time-lapse movie. It's sort of like the intervalometer, only this will assemble it into a video clip in camera. We choose the interval, the number of shots, the format that we're recording to, 4K or full HD. We can set auto exposure, turn the screen off. So there's tons of options and I'll demonstrate this on the crash course as well. The movie self-timer doesn't like it because I'm on a lapse here, but this, 
Movie self timer is just like a stills timer. We get a two to 10 second timer before we start video recording. Kind of nice if we want to be in it. We also have the ability to turn on a remote control, which is handy for remote video shooting to start and stop video recording. Some other options in here, we have our digital image stabilizer, which I always leave turned off. Auto level, we can customize our quick controls. We have a shutter button for movies. What do you want this to do in video mode? Fully depressed can start and stop video recording. I actually do like that. And half press will do metering and engage the servo focusing. Another good one down here are the zebra settings. Let's turn this on. I'll just go right here, choose this one. Anyway, I'm gonna turn this way up so, so we can get some overexposure. And there you can see it, we get these diagonal marching ants. That is the zebra effect. And the idea of this is we can put it on a setting like 100% or 95%. We know that when we start to see that, we're getting close to overexposure. So if we turn it down just a little bit, a little bit more. And it's a way to help us keep everything under control. You know, there are some things you want overexposed, but there are some things that you don't want overexposed. So the zebra indicators allow us to set a visual warning when we're running the risk of overexposure. I'm going to come in, turn those two off. Probably a more advanced feature for video shooting. Yeah, like C-Log. If you're a brand new photographer and videographer, don't even worry about that for right now. Couple other things that we haven't seen yet are standby low resolution, which means that when you have this turned on, the camera will revert to refreshing the displays at a lower resolution in order to save on temperature so you don't overheat when you start recording. I think it's probably a really cool idea. If you get a lot of overheating, turn that on, maybe it'll help. We got our HDMI display. So if we're exporting out on an HDMI cable, such as for an Atomos Ninja 5, do you want it to show on the monitor only, or do you want it to show on both? So this setting will allow us to display both on our monitor as well as the external HDMI. If we have this selected. There's a time and place for it. We also have our time code options, a bunch of different options in here in terms of free run or record run. I, I tend to be more of a record run guy. We can start manual input settings, probably a little bit more complex. But just know as you get into your video options, if you want to change your time code settings, this is where you do it. You always want drop frame on, HDMI, to display time code. Very nice. Let's come back out. And all this, ladies and gentlemen, is an overview of the deep menu system when we are turned to the video mode icon and how some of those features are different. If you have enjoyed this free tutorial and you're ready to invest in yourself to take it to the next level, Check out my Canon R7 crash course. The link is in the description. If it's not ready, it'll take you to my blog. You can leave your name and your email address. We will notify you as soon as it's ready. I wanna say thank you so much for watching this, for your support. It means so much to me and I look forward to bringing you more great videos about the R7. Can't wait to see you in the Facebook group. Have a great day.